today I want to tell you guys a story. It's a true story. Um, but before I do that, I want to ask you guys a couple of questions first. Um, so can I have a show of hands? Uh, how many of you guys here are under 10 years old? All right, we've got a couple. Awesome, awesome. Okay, leave your hands up. Uh, how about un those under 20? All right, a lot more. 30, under 30? Uh, give your hands up. And under 40? All right, I think almost 90% of you. All right, okay, thanks. You, you can put your hands down. Now, a different set of questions. Um, how many of you here think that you're going to die by the time you are 40 years old? Raise your hand. All right. By the time you're 50, by the time you're 60, leave your hand. Uh, leave your hand up. 70, 80. Okay. All right. I guess the rest of you think that you're gonna die past 100 years old. That's cool. Um, I'm g I'm gonna come back to that uh, to this later on. Uh, but let me just go back to the story. Uh, so like I said, this is a true story, and. This happened on 8th of July in 2012 at a place called Sancheong Bay in South Korea. Now, Sancheong Bay is a hub for um, aerospace research in Korea. It's about four hours drive from Seoul. And if you happen to be in Korea on 8th of July last year, and if you were to switch on to the evening news, uh, you'll probably come across the following report. 경남 사천 앞바다에서 시험 운항 중이던 위구선이 추락해 한 명이 숨지고 세 명이 다쳤습니다. Um, for those of you who don't understand Korean, uh, what the reporter was saying is that there had been a plane crash uh, early in the day in Sancheong Bay, and the incident involved a small airplane, four-seater plane, and there were four passengers inside. One died and three survived. And you can see in the video uh, the wreckage that remains. Um, essentially, the plane has crashed into the open water, flipped upside down, and one of the wings is gone. And um, I was actually dead that day. In fact, I was one of the three survivors. Um, so the story I want to tell you today is a very personal one. Um, I think, uh, so how did I end up in that plane in the first place? Um, I think a good place to start is to first show you what appears on my business card back then. So my job title back then um, was Head of Strategic Investment. I worked for this uh, investment firm based in Abu Dhabi. And it was a very decent job by most measures. I had a very good colleagues, I had a good boss, and the work can get somewhat interesting at times. And most importantly, the pay was very good. Uh, I was drawing a much higher pay than probably most of my peers. So I had good reasons to feel good about myself. And you are probably right to assume that I felt as self-important and pompous and arrogant as my job title would suggest. But anyway, uh, so one of the investment that I was looking at was this Korean company um, that manufactured this type of aircraft called Winging Ground, W-I-G. It's a pretty unique aircraft, and its usual mode of flight is to fly uh, parallel to the, to the sea surface, and it uses the air that bounces off from the sea surf surface to create additional lift. So it's a pretty, pretty uh, fuel-efficient aircraft. So as part of my due diligence, I thought I should at least try out the aircraft. Um, so along with one of my colleagues who is an Emirati, his name is Ahmad, and our Korean partner, his name is Robert, and together with the pilot, um, the four of us went for the flight test. So for about 15 minutes or so, the flight uh, was perfect. It was very smooth, very enjoyable, and I remember snapping pictures with my backberry and uh, just admiring the scenery. And then it happened, just like that. Um, one moment we were flying, the next moment I was already drowning. And the next 10 seconds or so proved to be the, the longest 10 seconds of my life. So it happened so quickly that it actually took me, I guess, the first three or four seconds to even realize that I was choking. And obviously, I don't wish this upon any of you here, but if something similar were to happen to you, uh, the immediate thing to do is to stop breathing. Because the more you try to breathe, uh, you're just going to swallow even more water and choke further, and this means that you're going to black out even sooner. And I guess the first miracle that happened to me on that day was even though I have started choking, I, I somehow managed to stop breathing and stop choking. And that brought me a few more precious seconds. And, but by the time I'm, I was able to stop breathing and kind of steady myself, um, that's when I first realized that, okay, I was going to die. And the next few seconds, um, well, felt like hours. And you know how people like to say when you're about to die, you kind of see your life uh, flash before your eyes? It was kind of like that. 
And uh, I, I remember uh, seeing my wife. I remember uh, seeing my parents. And I remember all the crazy ideas that uh, once really excite me and, uh, and that, that I told, that one, told myself that one day I'm going to pursue them. But at that moment when there's no more uh, hiding, no more running away, no more uh, pretending you know, behind this exterior image that I've created for myself, uh, the number one feeling I felt then was this tremendous sense of regret. I regret not being true to myself. Um, I regret not pu pursuing the ideas and things that actually really mean something to me. And I regret not spending more time with my wife, with my parents, and with my family. And with each passing second, I knew that the end was quickly approaching. Uh, I thought the water has come into the entire cabin and that the plane was actually sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And I knew under such a scenario, my chance of survival would basically be zero. But somehow my body kept on fighting. So it took me a while to realize that I was stuck in a very awkward position because of my seatbelt. So while the seatbelt has prevented me from uh, sustaining any serious injury upon impact, uh, it is now also uh, forcing me into a position where I was just keep drowning because I was upside down. So I tried feeling around for my seatbelt, and uh, once I reached the buckle, I tried to press it. I press it once, press it twice, it didn't work. And this is probably uh, eighth or ninth second into the whole thing. And then uh, I, I can feel myself uh, slowly losing consciousness. And I try pressing again, and I think on the fourth time, um, I managed to release the buckle, and I was free. But that doesn't mean that I was out of the woods yet, because if the water has filled up the entire cabin, I will still drown to death. And I guess that's where the second miracle comes in. So it turns out there was a pocket of air that was still trapped inside the cabin, maybe about 20 to 30 cm deep. And with that, I was able to do this and, and breathe. And at that point, I thought to myself, maybe, just maybe, this is not the day I'm going to go. And it was um, basically pitch dark inside the cabin, and I, I shouted around for Ahmed and Rob Robert, uh, but there was no response. And I tried feeling around uh, for the door, and turns out there was actually a hole uh, on one side of the plane. And when I, when I put my arm across the hole, that was when I, I guess the third miracle happened. I actually felt air on the other side, which means that the aircraft was actually floating instead of uh, sinking into the ocean, uh, which I had feared. So with one final push, I pushed myself uh, across from the hole, and fortunately the hole was big enough for me to squeeze through. And then on the other side, I saw light. And that's when I knew that I was going to live. Um, um, but around the same time, I also realized I actually had uh, broken my left shoulder, so I had to hang on to the plane to stay afloat. And over the next few minutes, I also found out that actually Ahmad and Robert were both still alive. Um, Ahmad had a very serious injury to his face. Um, he was his head was all bloody that day, and but his nothing happened to his body. Uh, Robert, on the other hand, he was actually sitting right beside me, and he was very seriously injured, him, and he was actually thrown off some distance away from the plane. But fortunately, Ahmad was still able to swim, so he swam out and got Robert back to the plane. And as for the pilot, um, I guess by the time the three of us more or less settled down back at the plane, um, at the back of our, our minds, we, we kind of know that the pilot was still inside the cabin, uh, but none of us were in any physical condition to go back in to save, save him. So I ended up sitting on the wing uh, while we waited for rescue. And that's when everything kind of sank in. And as I was nursing my uh, broken left shoulder, I saw the tattoo on my left arm. Um, it says, stay hungry, stay foolish. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is actually a phrase um, from, from a speech that Steve Jobs made at Stanford during a commenc commencement. And I got this done on my arm a couple of years ago because I was very inspired by the message in his speech. Uh, basically really pursuing your passion and really living every day as if it was your last. Um, but when it finally comes down to it, when I came so close to death myself, I realized that the tattoo was just part of the facade that I've created for myself. And in reality, um, I was still very much bogged down by conventions, by how society sees me, instead of doing the things that really matter to me. 
and you know now that it's been more than a year since the plane accident um and every now and then you know when people find out that i i gone through this they will say oh what a horrible thing that happened and uh, you know on hindsight actually i would say this is actually the best thing that has ever happened to me because it free me from the things that seem important but at the end at the very end actually means nothing you know when i was young um uh i guess 10 years old, uh, my dream was to become a professional footballer. Um, my idol back then was this guy called Roberto Baggio. He's an Italian football player. And then when I turned 20, I wanted to become a singer-songwriter. My One of my idols then was uh, Bob Dylan. And when, when I turned 30, I wanted to start my own startup because uh, you know, I idolized Steve Jobs and what he has done. And I guess it's only natural that as you grow older, you get exposed to new ideas and things uh, that your dreams will evolve. But what I realized is that while my dreams change over time, I've actually never done anything or, or made any serious attempt to pursue any of those dreams. So take my current dreams to, to uh, basically start a startup uh, as an example. It's actually been a dream of mine for more than 10 years already. So back then I used to think, all right, to start a company, I need capital, I need money. And it probably wouldn't hurt if I have some good job experience and some networking. So I decided, all right, I will stay on, on this job for a while more, you know, which pays very well, and I'll save up. And in due time, I will quit and use whatever savings I make um, to invest in my this great startup that I'm going to build. And so that was my plan. But you see, inherent in this plan of mine was the assumption that I was going to live at least a few more years, if not at least a few more decades, because that's probably how long it would take for me to carry out those plans. And obviously, the plan would have gone completely wrong had I died during the plane crash. Now, think back on earlier on when I asked you guys, um, you know, how old do you think you will be by the time you die? It seems that a vast majority of us have the assumption that we'll at least live past 50, 60, 70, and I saw some hands just now, even 80. So, especially when I think for, for us, you know, who consider ourselves young people, uh, we, we s in our minds, we, we think that we, have s we still have decades to live. And I think one of the reasons why we th have such assumption about our own lifespan is that it's actually incredibly difficult to imagine your own death. You know, people say uh, in order to plan for the future, you need to first imagine it. But how do you go about imagining your own death when you don't know when it's going to happen and you don't know how it's going to happen? I mean, there's literally uh, you know, limit, uh, not numerous ways for you to imagine your own death. I, I certainly, didn't, certainly didn't imagine myself to uh, almost die from a plane accident. But my point is, um, how, how do we, in our minds at least, you know, reconcile this uncertainty of the manner of death versus the knowledge that somehow, well, eventually everyone dies someday? And I think the way we do it, at least in our minds, is that we put this possible event called death into the distant future. Because the further it is into the future, I think our minds just have a more tolerance for such uncertainty. And because it seems such an uncertain thing, we just put it way uh, far out from the presence. But guess what? The only thing certain about life is death. And I think the topic of dying is, is sorely missing in our daily conversation, in our uh, cognitive consciousness, especially among the youths. And I think that just because it's hard to imagine your own death doesn't make the eventuality of it any less certain. And I reckon that by embracing death, and by that I mean embracing the certainty of it, while accepting the uncertainty of its timing, actually gives us much better clarity and direction in order to live a more meaningful life. And I must say that this mindset of constantly thinking about death has made all the difference in my life uh, since the accident. So now I've left my investment career. Um, right now I'm helping my wife with her own startup and I'm working on another one myself. And I, along the way, I, I started learning skateboarding and filmmaking and these are stuff that I, I wanted to learn for a long time. Um, and of course, I got to spend a lot more time uh, with my family. And you know, the thing is, not everyone is gonna get the second chance that I got and I don't expect myself to have the same chance ever again. Uh, which is why I felt compelled to stand before you today to share with you my story, uh, even though it's a bit painful for me to talk through in such detail. I really want you to think hard about your own mortality. 
about what you're going to do with whatever time you have left. So if you have something that you are really excited about, excited about or some, some passion of yours uh, that you haven't gone up, actually uh, done anything with it, I say go for it. Don't wait. And if you have a loved one that you haven't talked to in a while or have a quality time, I, I say you know, just call that person and spend some time with that person. Because the truth is, we don't know when our expiry day will come. We don't know how long more will we get to do all these things that actually mean something to us. Um, but I hope that when that, when that day finally comes, um, we won't have the same sense of tremendous regret that I felt when I was drowning in that plane. Instead, I hope that we will be able to say to ourselves that, all right, we've given this life the best shot that I've got with the time that I was given, and I'm ready to face whatever comes next. And this is something I wish for myself every day now, and this is something I wish for all of you as well. Thank you.